بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Welcome to the next installment in our video series on the reign of quantity and the signs of the times. This is the sixth installment having to do with chapter 5, which is entitled The Qualitative Determinations of Time. You will recall that Guénon concluded chapter 4, namely spatial quantity and qualified space, with the rejection of one of the infamous Kantian cosmological uh, antinomies, namely the question of whether space is finite or infinite, and he also uh, dispensed with the analogous notion of whether the universe is eternal or originated in time by saying that these are both meaningless questions. And then since he uh, had just discussed the notion of time, he said that this leads directly into considerations connected with the nature of time on page 37. And that is a very nice, smooth transition that flows right into chapter 5. So, again keeping in mind everything relative to everything else, chapter five has to be seen as a, an elaboration again of chapter three. Three, four, and five kind of form a, a, a triplet, a trinary. And in chapter three, he talks about measurement as uh, being intimately related with manifestation and how measurement is not purely quantitative. And so if measurement is not purely quantitative, extension is not purely quantitative, and therefore space is not purely quantitative, and there's a relationship between space and time, especially uh, in the light of modern uh, you know, Cartesian mechanism, uh, which is also kind of behind of, uh, a lot of his uh, reasoning in these chapters. And so now he wants to talk about how time is also not purely quantitative. And in fact, there are many uh, qualitative dimensions to time, and I think he does a very good job of discussing all of this in about seven pages, but there is much which is implicit and much that could be, what which could have been and indeed can be uh, elaborated upon at great length. Uh, that, of course, will not be possible in uh, a lecture series, a video series of this kind, but I will do my level best to um, at least point the interested viewer, the interested reader of this chapter uh, with some guidelines and suggestions for further investigation. Again, on addresses the theme quite directly. He says in the opening sentence of the chapter, if space is not pure quantity, time appears to be still less so. Now he concedes that it is possible to speak of spatial magnitudes as well as temporal magnitudes. However, it must be kept in mind that such magnitudes are or concern continuous quantity. And so in traditional philosophy, Continuous quantity is the subject proper of what? Geometry. Geometry. And he has already spoken about the symbolism of traditional geometry, not the profane geometry of the moderns, which they still call Euclidean geometry, which I think is a tremendous um, distortion, if not an insult to Euclid. <laughs> So again, here, he rejects Descartes. So having said that he's concerned with continuous quantity, in a long parenthetical remark, he says, for there is no occasion to pause to consider the strange conception of Descartes, according to which time is constituted of a series of discontinuous instants, so that it becomes necessary to assume a constant repetition of the act of creation, the world otherwise always vanishing away, during the intervals of temporal discontinuity, end of parenthetical. 
So space and time are both continuous and not discrete. And he rejects the notion of discrete instance. But then the thing is that with Descartes, and then with modern notions of quantity and modern notions of the infinitesimally small, which we, which play a huge role in calculus, as well as the infinitely large, <clears throat> um, um, if you have that idea of quantity and you apply it to time, then time is just a number of, of points, an infinite number of points on a temporal line, and those are instants. Um, <clears throat> but for Descartes, those instants are discontinuous. And so there's this idea that in between, you know, you have this unbridgeable gap. So the universe is created and destroyed at every instant, at every instant with a T. Now, oddly enough, there was a similar theory or theological doctrine espoused by the Ash'adi school back in the day, in the early history of Islamic philosophy. And um, it was um, adopted or explained or appropriated and interpreted in another way by Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi, and he called it Tajdid al-Khalq bil-Anfas, or the renewal of creation at every instant by the divine breath. But that is, <coughs> but that would be a, a digression. Suffice it to say that the notion of a series of discontinuous instants of time as espoused by Descartes is something which he rejects. Now there is a difference between space and time, even though they are both examples of continuous rather than discrete quantity, space can be measured directly using some sort of instrument, a ruler, for example. But time can never be measured directly. Time can only be measured, Genon writes, by relating it back in some way to space. Moreover, he makes the very fine point that, and I quote, what is measured, in other words, what is measured when we speak of measuring time, what is measured is never really a duration. <clears throat> so when we speak of three minutes or 45 minutes or nine hours, what is measured is never really a duration. It is the space covered in a certain length of time in the course of a movement of which the law is known. And as any such law expresses a relation between time and space, it is possible when the amount of space covered is known to reduce, to deduce, excuse me, therefrom, the amount of time occupied in covering it. And whatever may be the artifices employed, there is actually no other way than this whereby temporal magnitudes can be determined. In other words, time is always the measurement of some sort of a space. And regardless of how it's done, the point is that temporal magnitudes cannot be determined directly. They're always determined in relation to some sort of spatial measurement. All right. So that's um, the few basic points. So space and time are both continuous, not discrete quantity. Space can be measured directly. Time can only be measured indirectly. That is to say by, re by in relation to space. The next observation that he would like to make, which leads to the same conclusion, is that the only phenomena, and this is a direct quote at the bottom of page 38, which is the, the, the opening page of chapter 5, the only phenomena that are situated in space as well as in time are those that are properly called corporeal. In other words, physical bodies. So if you think of the traditional conception of philosophy <clears throat> and the seven liberal arts, so we have what? Logic, grammar, and rhetoric, rhetoric as the trivium Mm -hmm. And the quadrivium is what? Arithmetic, geometry, music, music, 
and astronomia, astrologia, astronomy slash astrology. Mm-hmm. They don't really talk about it, but the word astronomy and astrology were, were the same thing yeah. for the ancients. Um, so in arithmetic, one studies discrete quantity. In geometry, the object of study was continuous quantity. In music, you can think of it as quantity in time. Hmm. Right? I don't know much about music, but there is a... There's a time to yeah, it. Yes, yeah. so there's, there's rhythm, rhythm uh, these notions. Um, and then you have astronomy, which is quantity in space and in time. In other words, corporeal phenomena, bodies moving in space and time. Physical phenomena, corporeal phenomena. However, he says phenomena that are mental, mental phenomena, um, have no spatial character. Although they play out in time, they have no spatial character. And the mental, writes get on at the top of page 39, since it belongs to subtle manifestation, is within the individual domain necessarily nearer to essence than is the corporeal. The nature of time thus being such that it can reach into the subtle domain and therein condition mental manifestation. So again, under the two big headings of essence and substance, time is closer to essence than it is to substance. When you conceive of time as purely quantitative, like the moderns do, that's a reductionism. That's a reductionism to quantity. Time actually is closer to essence than it is to substance. And the example of that is that, well, first of all, it can only be measured indirectly. And moreover, that mental phenomenon do not have a spatial character. So the conclusion must be, he says, that the nature of time is more qualitative than that of space. Because space still has an extension. Mm-hmm. So the intrinsic nature of the mental, the intrinsic nature of the mental is akin to that which represents essence in the individual. Um, the way that Ganon phrases is, is that yeah, the intrinsic nature of the mental and so nothing that can... Uh, you have to go back to the beginning of the sentence. The things which the psychophysiologists determine quantitatively are not really in themselves mental phenomenon. As he's obviously talking about psychiatrists and physiologists of his time. Mm-hmm. As is imagined, but only some of their corporeal concomitants. In such investigations, there is nothing that comes anywhere near to contact with the intrinsic nature of the mental, and so nothing that can explain it in the smallest degree. The absurd idea of a quantitative psychology surely represents the fullest development of the modern scholastic scientific aberration. All right, well, that's a bit of an aside. He's just emphasizing that time, because it's related to mental phenomenon as well is far closer to essence and has, has more, much more of a qualitative character than a quantitative one. So if we can speak of qualified space, which was the point that he was making in chapter four, that the thing that really is, is the key element of space is that it is an assemblage of directional tendencies. And therefore we speak of a qualified space. It's all the more right, he says, to speak of qualified time or qualitative de- determinations of time. In other words, he says, that means that there must be fewer quantitative determinations and more qualitative determinations in time than in space. And so it's just as ridiculous to speak of empty time as it is to speak of empty space. Um, He also sort of is making the point at the end of chapter four when he talks about the absurdity of the question of whether the universe is eternal or originated in time, that outside this world there is no time. And inside, 
the world. Realized time contains all events, just as inside the world, realized space contains all bodies. So, in some ways, Genon continues, there is a kind of symmetry between space and time. And so they can often be spoken of in terms which are somewhat parallel. But the symmetry in question, which Genon is talking about, is not found with respect to the other conditions of corporeal existence. So this symmetry arises, the symmetry between space and time, arises on the qualitative pole, on the qualitative side rather than on the quantitative side. Um, and that was already pointed out, he said, by the fact that you know spatial magnitudes are determined directly and temporal magnitudes are determined in, in relation to space. Moreover, on the qualitative side, symmetry is conspicuously apparent in the correspondence existing between spatial symbolism and temporal symbolism, of which many examples have been given elsewhere. Uh, I take it elsewhere in his writings, he doesn't footnote this, but um, yeah, there are a lot of, his writings are vast, so there's symbolism of the cross, there's um, his book on uh, symbolism, symbols of sacred science, um, let's see if some other titles we can recommend, there's the list of his works, um, Yeah, he has the book on cosmic cycles. Where is that? Traditional forms and cosmic cycles. Uh, really across um, these kind of um, discussions of the, of the symbolism of space, spatial symbolism and of temporal symbolism are all over the place in his writings. Uh, especially since the notion of cyclical time, which he's going to talk about now uh, later in the chapter. Uh, cosmic cycles, the Kali Yuga, this is all very central to the work of Genon. So, he now wants to talk further about the qualitative determinations of time. And he begins then on page 40 to speak um, briefly about the qualitative differentiation of periods of time, which he sees as cyclical, he believes in the cyclical notion of time. So the qualitative differentiation of periods of time, um, and this qualitative differentiation is by virtue of the events which unfold within those periods of time. So just as different parts of space are differentiated by the bodies that they contain so that in a given room you have any number of objects that are related to each other in terms of their orientation, their distance, their situation, things we already talked about in the previous chapter. Similarly, you really, and, and so one room isn't equivalent to another room or one area of space is not exactly equivalent to another area of space. So similarly, equivalent durations of time, they might be quantitatively equal mm -hmm. But when they are filled by totally different sequences of events, they are not commensable. They're not. They're not the same. Not only that, but he says that quantitative equality disappears completely. If you go back to the mental realm, disappears completely from the mental appreciation of duration in the face of qualitative difference. So you can easily see this. An hour doing something you enjoy is not the same as an hour doing something you don't enjoy. Mm -hmm. When you're doing something enjoyable, it seems to pass faster. And they'll say, oh, well, this is an example of your psychology and, in that, and, and or your attitude, your mental attitude. Now, that may well be true in an example like that, but Genon has something more in mind. He says, you know, he says, uh, you see that... Um, if we concede this, that quantitative equality disappears completely from the mental appreciation of duration in the face of qualitative difference, if we concede that, then therefore, uh, 
it becomes necessary to inquire, to ask whether there be not something in the qualitative determination of events that originates from time itself, not from something mental that we impose on our experience of that duration. And he says, and it seems that such is recognized to be the case. He doesn't go into this, though, in too much detail. He just says that um, it seems to be the case. It seems to be recognized to be the case. If you actually study what astrology is as a traditional science, it is a symbolic science, and one looks at the quality of time. In astrology, there is something known as the astrological hours in the day, a particular, and it's not a 60 minutes as an hour. Um, so there, the notion of astrological hours is that you see when the sun comes up and you see when it goes down. And by the modern method, you would determine how many minutes of daylight that is. Then you would divide that by 12 and you would do the same for night. Mm -hmm. And so those hours may be 60 minutes long. They could be greater or lesser depending on the time of year and where you are located on the earth. So you have astrological hours so that the first such hour set calculated by the method I have alluded to on a Saturday would be ruled by Kronos, by Saturn. Mm -hmm. And that the first astrological hour in the morning on, let's say, on, let's say, Tuesday would be ruled by Mars. You see. Um, and you think, well, what does that mean? Of course, this is absolutely repulsive to the modern mentality, but these planets, ha they symbolize certain qualities. And there's further breakdowns of time. There were, there were larger intervals of time, which are, again, cyclical. So the astrological hours of the day, they cycle through. It'll begin with a, with a particular planet, which will be the planetary day. And then it will go through by a well-known sequence, which we can't go into here. It's not a secret, but you know we can, you can, you can download actually tables of astrological hours, and it will go through because there's only seven traditional planets, mm -hmm. and so it will cycle through. There's also the cycle of the seasons. There's also the cycle of there. There's also uh, associations with with the with the signs of the zodiac. Each sign of the zodiac has a planetary ruler, and it has. Some planets are in exaltation, as we say. They have a certain dignity, we say, and it's called essential dignity. There's rulership, there's uh, exaltation, and so on. This is all what is studied in, in astrology. There are, there are the astrological decans um, in the Indic system. There are the nakshatras, also in the Islamic system. They spoke of manazir al-qamar, or the lunar mansions, mansions of the moon. You have that in Chinese astrology as well and all of this is a symbolic science of space and time mm -hmm. but especially time space in the sense that you calculate the positions of the planets but with a view to understanding the quality or the nature of the moment in question and so when somebody is born that is also an astrological mm -hmm. moment in time and uh, in natal astrology there are various methods of doing prediction which then also allow the various planets to move and you see the quality of time and how that influences certain aspects of a person's life according to a host of other considerations mm -hmm. <laughs> that that is beyond our um yeah it's uh, beyond the scope of this talk to go into all of this in detail but just as a particular body cannot be situated in different indifferently in any place any more than a particular so similarly, it's no more that a particular event can happen indifferently at any time. And that's why there was an area of astrology also called electional astrology. Mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with politics or the election. Election meaning choice, choosing an opera, a, 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 a propitious time, choosing a benefic time to do something. Oh, I see. Choosing an auspicious time or date for, a cor for the coronation of a king. Mm -hmm. for the commencement of some extremely important task or undertaking or life event like a wedding mm -hmm. and so forth so if you're actually interested in any of the in this traditional science the best books on astrology really are by someone named John Frawley J O H N Frawley, F-R-A-W-L-E-Y. And if you don't really want to learn and 
practice astrology, then you should just read his book called The Real Astrology. If there's only one book on astrology you ever read in your life, that's the one you need to read. So if you understand that, then you see that time is not purely quantitative. It doesn't unroll itself uniformly, as Ganon says at the bottom of page 40. So that the practice of representing it geometrically by a straight line, which we find among modern mathematicians, conveys an idea of time that is wholly falsified, he says, by oversimplification. And in fact, he, go, he characterizes this as a pernicious simplification, very bottom of page 40. And he sees this as yet another characteristic of the modern spirit, and also that it inevitably accompanies a tendency to reduce everything to quantity. That's the reign of quantity. And as we already said, in our example of astrology, Ganon says that the correct representation of time is to be found in the traditional conception of cycles. And there are larger and larger cycles. Mm -hmm. And on, on a massive scale of time, of, 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 of unimaginable durations, this is a doctrine which you really only find set out in detail in the Indic tradition, the doctrine of the yugas. Um, so the conception of cycles and this conception obviously involves a qualified time. Besides, whenever the question of a geometrical representation arises, whether in fact it be set out graphically or only expressed through the use of an appropriate terminology, it is clear that a spatial symbolism is being made use of. So in astrology, for example, they talk about the different seasons. And so there are four cardinal points then that are set out, which are the solstices and the equinoxes. Mm -hmm. and so that's a spatial symbolism you put them like in the form of a circle and again that's a cross because you have summer solstice winter solstice autumn equinox and spring equinox so there is a spatial symbolism and um, there is a kind of correlation between these things as well as the uh, uh, a, a correlation between these things and the qualitative determinations of time and those of space Um, in terms of the, quali uh, the qualitative determinations of space, you already talked about what's the thing, most important element of space, it's direction. Mm -hmm. So the notion of directions, orientations, um, and so that again brings in the notion of traditional uh, geomantic, uh, not geomancy, but traditional uh, notion of sacred space, feng shui, in the Chinese tradition, Vastu Shastra in the Indian tradition. It's interesting in the feng shui, the whole thing is based on the three by three magic square. Uh, this is a vast subject. Uh, if you're interested in that, there are, I would recommend for regarding uh, Chinese uh, feng shui, the writings of um, Dr. Stephen Skinner uh, in terms and with respect to Vastu Shastra. Um, there is a book in English by Robert Svoboda. I, I don't remember the name of the book. Svoboda is S-V-O-B-O-D-A. He is a scholar of the of Ayurveda. Um, there are a lot of books on the 3 by 3 magic square. And there's one called the Luo Shu, which you can read. Uh, do we have that book here? Should we find it? Um, the Legacy of the Luo Shu, the 4,000 year search for the meaning of the magic square of order three. It's an excellent book. And there's also The Secret of Luo Shu, Numerology in Chinese Art and Architecture. Right. So, again, there's a lot that could be said here. Uh, we're just giving you some books for further reading. You can investigate these things in more detail. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, this is also elaborated upon in the footnote, footnote number one, about traditional symbolism. He talks about the zodiac. And then there's another footnote on the qualitative determinations of space and time and their correspondences with reference to an Orientalist named Marcel Granet, whom he doesn't um, like too much. Uh, but um, we don't need to go into any detail. You can read that yourself. 
so the doctrine of cycles is absolutely fundamental to the quali to a qualitative notion of time and this doctrine of cycles is fundamental to this entire study as he says this notion of the reign of quantity um, <clears throat> And he says that he can't really go into a detailed exposition of this doctrine of cycles. You may refer to his other book, but he would like to make um, three, he says a few observations, and it's exactly three that he makes that are more directly concerned with the subject of this book taken as a whole. Uh, three observations, namely on the nature of time. So let's just spell out what those are. First of all, time and this is the nature of time with reference to this doctrine of cycles. So he says <clears throat> that the first observation is that as we get to the last cycle, which is the Kali Yuga, the, the speed of time, if you like, mm -hmm. in short form, what he really means, what I really mean is the speed of events as they transpire uh, in the cycle. And as you get later and later in the cycle, and when you get into the last cycle, which is the Kali Yuga, and then you get into the, the the expansion of the Kali Yuga itself, time speeds up, or the speed of time, so to speak, or the the speed of events in a qualitative sense, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. speed up. And the second observation has to do with direction, and this brings in the spatial symbolism that this is a very rapid movement downward, downward yeah. a descent, a de evolution. It's not progress because as the cycle progresses so to speak as it moves further and further along it 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 uh, separates more and more and moves further and further away temporally speaking from the principle mm -hmm. and so there has to be an increase of quantity <clears throat> and um, that leads to the third observation which uh, is that we live under a reign of quantity that as as the as the cycle expands further and further uh, everything increases in the quantitative direction towards the the pole of substance so let's just quickly go into these in a bit more detail and that will conclude the chapter so the first of these observations is as follows not only has each phase of a temporal cycle of whatever kind it may be its peculiar quality that influences the determination of events, but the speed with which events are unfolded also depends on these phases. Okay. And is therefore of a qualitative rather than a quantitative order. So obviously, it's not speed in the modern quantitative sense. We're speaking analogically. Mm -hmm. So he says that in speaking of the speed of events in time, by analogy with the speed of displacement of a body in space, a transposition of sorts is effected of the notion of speed. For speed in time cannot be reduced to quantitative expression as can be done in mechanics when speed properly so-called is in question. Direct quote from Genon, page 42. What this means is that according to the different phases of the cycle, Sequences of events, sequences of events comparable one to another do not occupy quantitatively equal durations. This is particularly evident in the case of the great cycles, applicable both to the cosmic and to the human orders, the most notable example being furnished by the decreasing lengths of the respective durations of the four yugas that make up a manvantara. So... The Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, as they would be called in the Greek system, mm -hmm. all of those four yugas or ages together in the Indian system taken as in aggregate form what's called a manvantara. And they get faster and faster. In fact, they're shorter and shorter, actually. So, And the relationship is 4, 3, 2, 1. And if you add 4 to 3, you get 7. Plus 2 is 9. Plus 1 is 10. 10. Yeah. So this is the Pythagorean Tetractus also. The sum of all natural numbers. So 
events being unfolded nowadays are 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 being unfolded events being unfolded nowadays are with a with a speed unexampled he says in the earlier uh, ages and so there is he says a progressive contraction of duration now you may not agree with it you know if, if you don't and the moderns of course are not going to agree but you know as most as most people who are going watching this and hearing this for the first time they have been they have been socialized into the all of these modern notions you think well this doesn't make any sense uh, if, if you're you know thoroughly mm -hmm. indoctrinated in, in modern you know Cartesian mechanics and all of this none of this makes any sense but I think everyone would concur that they feel overwhelmed by events. Yeah. That they feel that they don't have enough time to do anything. Yeah. Uh, that especially if you are part of the lower ends of what is the e effective and de, de facto counter tradition caste system today, and you're part of the 99%, as they call it, you're spending all of your time working to service your debts. Mm hmm. That's mo most people are in this situation today. Even a small example is the news. I mean, y you move from one headline to another in two weeks. Or in two weeks, so there's no time. At most, yeah. So there is a qualitative dimension. Even anecdotically, uh, intuitively, people can grasp what is happening. And you will find this is very hard to find now, but but even in the in in, in let's say the early part of the 20th century, people who went uh, uh, to what was at that time at least a very different east you know they would leave the western world europe america <clears throat> and go and have <clears throat> some sort of exposure to whatever remained of, of traditional societies mm -hmm. and you see this even in, in writings of people many of uh, many people you know for example like people who went um you know people like titus burkhardt for example he he went and lived in fez for some time mm -hmm. or if you read these are traditionalist authors um uh, Marco Pallas, his book, uh, Peaks and Llamas. Um, they noticed something, and that was that people in those traditional societies weren't in a hurry. They did right. things more slowly. Obviously, modern industry is geared toward mass production and manufacturing. Craftsmanship is not. This comes up in, in a later yeah. chapter in, in, Gidon's, in this very book of Gidon. Uh, those things take time. And I remember I, I like Arabic calligraphy and I've taken various classes and with Arabic calligraphy with people, with different, you know, well-known people. Um, you have to do it slowly. Yeah. And I remember there were some classes we had, that I attended in which there were a lot of people and they were just, uh, the guy would say, okay, go write this letter and they'd just be done and they'd come up and say, what are you doing? Go back and you have to, and you have to do it many, many, many times and you have to do it slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, people are amazed, you know, how, how did, this wasn't that long ago. I mean, how did, uh, someone like Ibn Sina, this, this is actually a long time ago. How did Ibn Sina, you know, write all that he did? You know, how did he have yeah. time to do this? And this is still in the Kali Yuga. But the thing about the Kali, each Yuga is that it, all of the other Yugas are reflected in it. So when the Kali Yuga began, it was the golden age within the Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. But now we're in the Kali Yuga of the Kali Yuga. So mm -hmm. things can only get worse. And, and the, the dimension of quantity takes over. Mm -hmm. Or how did someone like, uh, uh, you know, the author of Jawahir al-Kalam, is 43 volumes, that wasn't that long time, it wasn't such a long time. How did they pull this off? Yeah. So we... we even we, Ganon. You know, <laughs> even Ganon, Ganon yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so there is something to be said about the speed of events about the quality of a particular moment and then the question is well all right well fine we live in the Kali Yuga. in fact we're living in the Kali Yuga of the Kali Yuga. how do you get out of it mm -hmm. in one sense you can't get out of it because you can't leave the space and time in which you were born but you remember there's something called the mental realm the subtle realm well there is a way where you completely overcome this negative temporal flow but that has to be by bringing about the eschaton so to speak within your very being that is the area of practical irfan 
of practical gnosis. That is the area uh, traditionally dealt with by Sufism, for which to really do it correctly, you must have an initiation. Get on understood this. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to have some sort of a um, transmission, a living transmission. The methods of realization and concentration upon the real. Um, of course, many people today are not really up to the task because their personalities have been so mm, disintegrated and they are uh, in a state of such disintegration. You do not have, most people today do not have an integrated personality and they are not able to really take up genuine and real Sufism. They might be involved with all sorts of, you know, hocus pocus Sufism. <laughs> Gentrified Sufism. Wearing a certain pointed hat and... Yeah. There's nothing wrong with these things, mind you. Uh, um, I like, the, you know, these traditional uh, garments and all of this, but uh, Sufism is not being part of some sort of a social club mm -hmm. or a clique. It's much more complicated and much more profound than all of that. Anyhow, not to digress. So the first observation about the quantitative determinations of time as they relate to the doctrine of cycles is that as the cycles proceed and you get to the last cycle and as the last cycle proceeds further and further and further, the events that transpire therein acquire a dizzying kind of speed. And they get faster and faster because they are like a boulder that is rolling down a hill. It's picking up speed. So that's the second observation. And that's connected with a descending direction of the cyclical movement insofar as this movement is regarded as the chronological expression of a process of manifestation that implies a gradual separation, a descent, in other words, symbolically speaking, from the principle. <clears throat> so he says that the spatial analogy in question here is of considerable interest. And so he says it's the increase in the speed of events as the end of the cycle draws near can be compared to the acceleration that takes place in the fall of heavy bodies. So either you drop them from a height and they hurtle through the air towards the ground or um, uh, the course of the development of the present humanity closely resembles the movement of a mobile body running down a slope, you know, down an inclined plane, going faster as it approaches the bottom. Uh, and he thinks that this picture is a very accurate picture of the cyclical movement that we find ourselves in today. The third and final observation has to do with the descending movement of manifestation and consequently of the entire cycle of which it is an expression. And that is that this descending movement of manifestation takes place away from the positive. So when it's moving away from the principle, it's moving away from the positive or essential pole of existence towards its negative or substantial pole. And the result is that all things must progressively take on a decreasingly qualitative and an increasingly quantitative aspect. And that is why the last period of the cycle must show a very general tendency toward the establishment of a reign of quantity. And this is where the, we take the title of, he took the title of his book. Now, this reign of quantity is not, something to be seen from merely a human point of view. He says this is for all things. It's not just some sort of attitude we've taken. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> it's all quantification and quantity. No, the actual environment itself, mm -hmm. the very boundary conditions, so to speak, of our existence, the very stuff, the very warp and weft of our lives, Temporally speaking, this environment has undergone a real and true modification at the mm. level that where, where all where things matter most. It's a real modification of the environment itself that's involved. Each period of the history of humanity corresponds specifically to a determinate cosmic moment so that there must necessarily be a constant correlation between the state of the world itself or of what is called nature in the usual sense of the word and more especially of the terrestrial environment and the state of mankind, whose existence is evidently conditioned by that environment. Of course, most people will just reject all of this today. And um, 
that's even if they hear this. And most people won't hear this at all. So they're completely ignorant of this. Mm -hmm. So he says, it may be added that total ignorance of such cosmic modifications is not least among the causes of the incomprehension of modern science whenever anything beyond certain limits is concerned. Itself born of the very special conditions of the present world, this science is all too obviously incapable of conceiving other and different conditions, incapable even of the mere admission that anything of this kind could exist. Mm -hmm. Thus the point of view that constitutes the definition of modern science establishes barriers in time, which it is impossible for science to break down as it is for short sighted person as it is for a short sighted person to see clearly beyond a certain distance. A true intellectual myopia is indeed thoroughly characteristic in all respects of the modern and scientific mentality. Now what these modifications are will be elaborated upon later in the book but before he does that he has to talk about in chapter six the principle of individuation uniformity against unity and then i think it's around chapter eight that he gets into concrete examples so to speak ancient crafts in contrast to modern industry for example um he talks about anonymity the obsession with statistics which is very much a part of the reign of quantity um hatred of secrecy Unity, uniformity, rationalism, mechanism, materialism, degeneration of coinage, etc., etc. Just to make, mention a few of these. Not in any, stay tuned. Yeah, more or less in, in order. Uh, yeah, so indeed, stay tuned. But um, so those things will be looked at in more detail. They're only being alluded to now in a general way, he says. But then he makes a very interesting observation at the, a very interesting uh, remark uh, as he winds up the chapter and we'll just say a word or two about this and conclude. He says, but it may already have occurred to the reader that many things nowadays regarded as fabulous were not at all so for the ancients. So we talk about astrology, we talk about miracles, we talk about clairvoyance. He hasn't talked about any of these things, but mm -hmm. I, I imagine that's what he's talking about. I imagine that's what he has in mind. And even that they may still not be so for those who have retained not only the possession of certain aspects of traditional knowledge, but also an outlook that allows them to reconstitute the shape of a lost world. What does he mean by that? I'm not entirely sure. Hmm. To reconstitute the shape of a lost world, does that mean that there are some people who can still think this way? Is that who he is addressing? And they may, yeah. they can, they can, they can um, reconstitute the horizons of such a world within themselves. And then he says, as well as to foresee, at least in its broad.